to oh, uh, mate. be out partying and going to all the places that we shouldn't be going to. <laughs> when my dad said don't go, I'd go. You know, to areas where like the, at that time the National Front was big. That was in like in Dagenham, Barking. So sometimes going looking for a fight or not? Oh no, there was a club down there that, you know, that the National Front didn't like, but we'd still go. By the 1970s, the National Front's demands for repatriation and an end to immigration brought about a fierce anti-racist backlash. Meanwhile, in the streets of East London, Nigel and Colin were waging their own private war against racism. There was a famous saying that we grow up, Wagga matter, nigger mind, go black army if you're white tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the fight would start. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I didn't go looking for trouble. I didn't go and say, oh, I want to fight. I wasn't like that. But if it came to me, I would, I would deal with it. So why did it come to you then? Because we, we didn't, me and Colin, we didn't back down. We didn't back down. We walked past you, you might hear you black. What? What? It didn't mean... <laughs> so most of the bother you got as a kid was generally from people yeah. having a go at you because you were black? Yeah, I thought it like that, yeah. It wasn't other black kids having a go particularly? No, not really. I didn't really ever fight many fight with black guys. OK. Yeah, the majority of the time that I was fighting was like with the National Front. Because I had a lot of white friends, but it was just like fighting with the National Front. But then the white friends with us, we all fight, with, fight against them. Because the areas that we went, <laughs> they're like no-no areas, but I ain't going, I'm going where I want to go. So all no the back and down. You and Colin would take them on. Oh, man, we took on everybody. You know, we're talking about these are like big guys that we were fighting. We were like, say, like 12, 13. They were like, you know, 18, 19. Nigel grew up very quickly. By the time he was 12, he and Colin were already staying out late and going to clubs. We used to hang about with probably more elder guys than ourselves. You found that them guys would kind of look after you in one sense, um, so you kind of could go anywhere. <laughs> um, all them guys you used to look after, they was a bit harder, you know, bigger than us. And but, hard. Uh, they were you know. hard. So you hung around with guys that were older than you, bigger yeah, they, than you? Yeah, they would be like, if I was about 12, they'd be like 19, 20. OK. I just hang out with all big guys, much older than me. I felt comfortable around them. Did they remind you of somebody, do you think? Um, one did, Carl Marston. He was, um, I don't know. He actually reminded me of my brother Andy. As Nigel grew older, he progressed from tough kid to bully and thief. And he soon became well known to the police. So did you get a reputation as a kid or not? Were you known amongst... Oh, yeah. What was your reputation? Like my birthday at school, I made everybody in school bring me 50 pence to score my birthday. And then they called the police up for me. I thought, that's how we're going to make bucks. Right. I would go and do shoplifting in Woolworths and nick all of... had watches on the arm I used to just wanted things I just grew up much quick I just but your dad sort of was aware or not aware of this stuff oh yeah without the police station come and get me and I'd die with my dad coming there so you would die you would feel <laughs> guilty and bad no that is gonna wring me neck <laughs> all right oh, oh wow and would he yeah Did he? yeah yeah we used to know this guy named Kevin introduced us to stealing and we used to go every Saturday we used to go out shopping stealing this is a thing and you know you set up with these goods and you think wow got this and I got this today and I got this today it went on for about two to three weeks and on the third week Saturday morning probably about half past eight um, nine o'clock knock knock on the door <laughs> my mum's opened the door it was my, my dad <laughs> Nigel Ben's dad <laughs> Hello, hello, um, uh, Mrs. Chambers. Um, I don't know if you know me, but I'm Nigel's dad. Can I have a word of me, please? Well, I was in the other room talking, and I'm trying to hear it. I don't know where Nigel's getting all these goods from, but I'm sure not giving him enough money to go and buy them. So the only thing I can think is that they're all stealing it. Okay, Mr. Ben, thank you very much. Close the door. Well, 
<laughs> my mom didn't hit that. me. She didn't hit me. She beat me up <laughs> for at least half an hour. And you're getting beaten for half an hour. <laughs> That's something. And I'm crying, Mum. All right, Mum. All right. So Nigel the next night down at the mocker and he's got a walking stick. <laughs> his dad beat him up. <laughs> when I had a street fight, I remember when, um, oh, the police came to get me because I had a fight with this Indian guy. And um, I was in the police station and all my colour just drained out of me. And my dad came in there, I was like, and he said, I don't mind you fighting, but if you go and nick anything of anybody, you're in big trouble. So that was it. So he had like, you know, you got to look after yourself. But for when that shoplifted, mate, you, you can't do things like that. And um, he slapped me hard, hard. Despite his father's strong sense of discipline, Nigel got into more and more trouble. When he was found guilty of grievous bodily harm, his parents realised he was heading for prison. I remember when I got done for shoplifting GBH, handling, standing good in GBH again. GBH? See, that's a pretty heavy thing to be charged with. Mm. Did you go to court? Yeah. And find guilty? Mm, yeah. One of his older brothers, John, who still lives only a few streets away from his parents' house, was in the army at the time, and his parents pleaded with him to help channel Nigel's aggression. When I was a kid, all Nigel used to do was fight. He enjoyed scrapping. He could bet your life, and Nigel went anywhere, he'd get in a fight. Nigel's life was governed by fighting. I mean, you could bet your life, if Nigel went up Ilford, see someone, met a couple of boys, it was scrapping. Even at 12 and 13, Nigel could look after himself. He was a very tough and determined guy. No one would trust him because if you do, you're going to end up on the wrong side. The aggression might have come from my brother. Andy. Yeah, I, I feel that I carried a lot through from that because I could have really hurt people then. It wasn't just the death of Andy that left a deep scar. It was the way he died. The accident appears to have been caused when Andy leapt from the first floor window of a house only a few streets from where Nigel and his family lived. But doubts about why the accident happened have left simmering anger and thoughts of revenge, especially in Nigel and his father. Sometimes the thought would just flash in my mind. And I know where they were, I know everything. You thought about it? Mm. Getting revenge? I've, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, um, without telling none of my family, I was just going to go and take revenge. And you've never told them about that? Mm, no. No, I wanted to. But you're saying you could have really done some damage, mm. and you're linking it to the death of Andy. Yeah, because I think at that time I'm a bit more mature now. But there was a time when it could have been out of control. Yeah, because of what I wanted to do. Meaning? Yeah, it could have been out of control. Is that frightening? Was mm. it frightening, that thought? Yeah, because you know what it was? It was, um, if I killed somebody, it'd be like, I would, ne would never want to take anybody's life. I, you know, it, it was one of them things that, um, you know, you think about how, how could they kill my brother, and I was just like, really, really cut up. Even in my 20s, I was still cut up. I always remember this, I rang up my mum, my mum's on the phone, Mum, I said, Mum, what's up? You was crying, sobbing, and I said, Mum, what's up? said, listen, John, I need you to do me a big favour. You need to get him, Nigel, into the army ASAP, yeah? Because he's like, he, he, he's, either, he's fighting, he's going to kill somebody, or he's going to get killed. Get him in the army. And, and from then, I said, put him on, we had a chat and that, and um, basically, from then, that's when he's, his mind turn to come into the army, you know what I mean? Yes, I yes, I had said to John, get him in the army, I said, because I'm going mad. It was nothing but trouble. <laughs> fight, fight, fight. Yeah, but that was it. Would not do yeah, anything. He didn't do no one any harm, but it was just, just, just fight, fight, fight just fighting. He just loved fighting. Just love fighting. Just love fighting. Yeah. Well I said now, nah. I said, you're not going to end up inside. I said, I'll put you in hospital. But you would not go inside mm -hmm. over my dead body, you know. I, I, was, I meant it. I said to him, I said, I'll break both your legs. So you're not going to go inside. That's not the place yeah. to go, you know. 
let me tell you something now. If it wasn't for my dad, I can guarantee you that I could have been holding up banks and everything. But because of his love and his perseverance, he used to say to me, by hook or by crook, you ain't going to do nothing. You ain't going to by nicking over my dead body. He would always he would say, over his dead body, am I going to end up inside? Over his dead body.